welcome to the 2022 Conference on Engaged Learning. I'm Jesse Moore, the Director of the Center for Engaged Learning, and I'm delighted that you all were able to join us tonight. Um, before I get too far with this introduction, I do want to reassure you that there will be continued beverage service. They are going to move the bar inside, but they will be able to um, refill your wine or beer or non-alcoholic beverage of your choice um, as they come around the tables. So uh, rest assured, it's not going away. Um, we, have, we believe in a hierarchy of needs. People need to be well fed and, and be in good shape just have what their needs met, so we'll say, say that. Um, I also need to say happy Father's Day to the fathers and father figures in the room. And happy anniversary to our executive director, Peter Felton, and his wife, Sarah Walker. And yes, and Sarah's not even here, unfortunately. <laughs> Otherwise, we would be trying to treat her to dinner. Um, and happy Juneteenth. And we'll talk more about Juneteenth tomorrow, but I do want to mark it tonight. Um, we seem to have a knack for scheduling this conference over um, various holidays and anniversaries. Uh, and so I did want to very briefly say that the behind the scenes story on that is that this conference is always adjacent to whichever of our research seminars is in its final summer. And we only have a five week window for those research seminars in terms of summer facilities availability on campus. And one of those weeks, at least one of those weeks is always taken out by the July 4th holiday. So. Uh, that's how we often end up on Father's Day or seminar leaders or executive directors, anniversaries, and the like. So, But hey, it's a good celebration. So just a few words before I introduce our, our keynote speaker for tonight. Uh, Elon University's name comes from Hebrew for oak tree. And our roots are both rich and complicated. This area was first inhabited by the Siouan-speaking Native American tribes, with the Okanichi being the most dominant by, this, by 1650. I would like to acknowledge that we are on the land of the Eno, the Tutelo, the Saponi, the Okanichi, and Shikori Native people by reading a statement adapted from the official Okanichi land acknowledgement statement. And it's adapted only to be read by non-Native or non-Indigenous people, um, but otherwise is their official statement. So we are gathered today on land that was traditionally part of the territory of the Saponi people in Piedmont, um, in the Piedmont of what is now the state of North Carolina. This area is not far from the great trading path used by both the native people and the non-native peoples during the early years of contact. The Saponi people, whose descendants include the Ochanichi Band of Saponi Nation Indian Tribe, still thrive and live in this region, officially recognized by the state government of North Carolina. The Okanichi are connected to this land spiritually and physically. It provided all they needed to sustain their communities. They hunted in the forests, fished in the streams, and grew the crops that sustained their families. They picked the wild grapes, gathered the acorns, and harvested the poplar bark to build their homes. They raised their children and protected their families. They are bonded and one with this land yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It flows within their veins. Despite how the landscape has changed, regardless of the concrete, asphalt, and steel that covers it today, it is still their home, and the bones of their ancestors sleep in this part of Mother Earth. As we come together here, do not forget that the Okanochi people love this land. Although most of us who live and work on it today have little knowledge of their past and present existence. They did not sell and willingly vacate the land, so it remains in their hearts. This land does not belong to man, we belong to the land. The Okanichi people ask that you will keep these thoughts in mind while here in place and treat it with the respect, love, and care that their ancestors did, and as they do so today. Tomorrow, we'll acknowledge additional Elon roots. For now, Mekorma Chen Kiho, you are welcome here. There's a danger of land acknowledgments, of course, being performative. 
I hope, though, that centering this land's history and the injustices that have occurred here will prompt us to apply a critical social justice lens to our conversations tonight and tomorrow as we share and discuss our engaged learning scholarship and practices. Thank you. And as I said, I'll, I'll share more of our historical roots tomorrow. I'm pleased to introduce the other members of the conference planning team. Julia Bleakney here in front, director of the Writing Center and associate professor of English. <laughs> Paula Rosinski, director of writing across the university and professor of professional writing and rhetoric is not able to be here tonight, but was very instrumental in planning and, and preparation for this conference. Uh, <laughs> Christina Wittstein, who is out in the lobby and is the program coordinator for the Center for Advancement of Teaching and Learning and Center for Engaged Learning. And we will reiterate when she's in the room our appreciation for everything she does. <laughs> and then I also wanted to acknowledge sales managing editor Jenny Goforth, who you'll see taking pictures throughout the conference and is also one of those women that I can rely on as a go-to person. So thank you, Jenny. So please connect with any of us if you have questions throughout the conference. We're happy to help. So, and now it's my privilege to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Laura Gonzalez is Assistant Professor of Digital Writing and Cultural Rhetoric at the University of Florida. Her research on the intersections of language diversity, community engagement, and technology design align perfectly with our conference themes of engaged learning and writing transfer beyond the university. Dr. Gonzalez's research and professional activities attest to her commitment to understanding, better serving, and learning from diverse student populations. And I will have to interject here Paula wrote this introduction, and as I was rereading it, I was exhausted by all of Dr. Gonzalez's accomplishments, and you will understand that in a moment. So her work, or me, sorry, her book, Sites of Translation, What Multilinguals Can Teach Us About Digital Writing and Rhetoric, won the 2016 Digital Rhetoric Collaborative Book Prize, and the 2020 Conference on College Composition and Communication Advancement of Knowledge Award. We also can look forward to reading her forthcoming book, Designing Multilingual Experiences and Technical Communication, now available for pre-order. Dr. Gonzalez is the co-editor of Latina Leadership, Language and Literacy Education Across Communities, and the co-author of Indigenous Language Interpreters and Translators Toward the Full Enactment of All Language Rights. She is the Vice President of the Association of Teachers of Technical Writing, and the editor of Reflections, a journal of community-engaged writing and rhetoric. And to top off all of those impressive accomplishments, she's the winner of the 2020 Seven Seas Technology and Innovator Award and the 2020 Michelle Kendrick Outstanding Digital Production Scholarship Award. Dr. Gonzalez's talk, Translating Writing Across Communities, Emerging Frameworks for Building Community Accountable Writing Pedagogies Through Multilingual Orientations, explores what multilingual communicators can teach us about community engagement, community engagement and writing beyond the university. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gonzalez. I love it when the technology works on the first try. I don't guarantee it's going to continue to work throughout the presentation, but that was good that it popped up. Thank you so much, um, Jesse, for such an amazing introduction. Um, thank you to the um, Engaged Learning Conference Committee, um, including Julia Bleakney, Paula Rosinski, Jesse Moore, and Christina Woodstein for the invitation to serve as one of the keynote speakers for this year's conference. Um, I also want to thank all of you for being here. This is a really difficult time. We're still facing a lot of loss. Um, we're still processing a lot of grief. And we're struggling. Um, and yet we're here. We've come together for many reasons, because we care about our students. We care about the communities that we work with. Um, and so I want to thank you and take the time to acknowledge all that we're facing and the effort that we're making to be in community 
community together today. So thank you for that. Um, so as you know, the pandemic continues to evolve um, and our situations continue to shift, and as a community-engaged researcher, I continue thinking about ways to um, incorporate genuine opportunities for my students to bring in who they are into the classroom in a truly genuine way. And that includes bringing in their linguistic resources, their linguistic histories, um, and all parts of their identity so that we don't have this binary or this wall between the institution, the communities that our students are working in, and everything else that's going on around us. So what I want to share with you today are some strategies for doing that, some strategies that I'm still continuing to develop that I would love some of your feedback on. Um, and I also want to model some of the activities and some of the ways that I do this with my students to maybe share those ideas with you um, and so that we can engage in a discussion about these later on. So I want to begin, like I begin many of my classes, by helping us set our intention. In her book, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, activist and organizer Adrienne Marie Brown points us to the power of making small connections, of building new worlds through powerful engagements and interactions with each other, in the same way that all organisms grow into ecosystems and society. Brown reminds us, quote, the crisis is everywhere, massive, 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 and we are small. But emergence notice the way small actions and connections create complex systems, patterns that become ecosystems and societies. Emergence is our inheritance as part of this universe. It is how we change. Emergence strategy is how we intentionally change in ways that grow our capacity to embody the just and liberated worlds we long for. Drawing on Afrofuturistic principles and the work of Octavia Butler in particular, Adrienne Marie Brown's concept of emergent strategy reminds us that every encounter with another human being is an opportunity for connection, for a small step toward change. And I need a reminder of this all the time as I'm in this like, automatic mode of just going through the motions from one Zoom room to another, right? This reminder about intention. Every minute in a Zoom room, at a conference like this one, in a classroom, in line at a grocery store, is a chance to work ever so slightly toward justice. If we choose to acknowledge time as opportunity and as a chance for radical collaboration. Drawing on the work of Angela Davis, Adrienne Marie Brown reminds us, quote, that radical simply means grasping at the root, getting to the heart of the matter and addressing systemic issues directly and collectively. So I begin this presentation with Brown's words in the same way that I begin all of my courses, getting us or getting my students to briefly reflect on what we want to get out of our shared space for opportunity today. So if we have about an hour together, or 45 minutes here, in this room at this conference and we're setting the tone for a conference about engaged learning, how are we going to engage? How are we going to listen? What are we going to share? What is our intention in joining and partaking in this space today? So I want to give you just maybe three minutes, um, and you can share with people at your table if you'd like. You don't have to share. Write down or just reflect on what are your intentions for the conference? What are your intentions for your time here today? What did you want to get out of this, um, this keynote presentation? Maybe you will, maybe not. Maybe I won't meet those expectations. But take just a few minutes to reflect on that and think about the intention that you're going to bring into the room as we engage in our time together. Thank you. I know that was not nearly enough time, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but I just wanted to give you a couple of minutes um, to connect with each other and also to connect with your intention for engaging in this space today and just kind of set the tone for the conference, um, building off what Jesse already set up for us. So thank you. So in addition to thinking about intention, right, when, we, when I start my classes, I ask students to think about intention, even when it's a, a Zoom class or a class that's taking place virtually, to help us connect and help us think about we're here. So let's make the best of this opportunity and this opportunity that we have to work ever so slightly toward justice with whatever resources we bring to the table. At the same time, right, we can't assume that we going into a space is automatically going to lead to some work toward justice. We also have to be aware of our positionality. And so when I think about positionality and I ask my students to think about positionality, I'm asking us to consider who we are so that we can understand how we're going to interact with others. And positionality can be considered on several levels. So you can think about who you are individually, the positionalities that you hold, what you know about yourself. 
But another thing that I think is really important to consider is how others see you, right? How others perceive you, how you entering a space, a community space, shifts that space, right? It inherently shifts that space in multiple different ways and you're read in certain ways um, that don't always align with how you see yourself, right? So as we think about um, uh, intentions, I also want us to think about, just really briefly, one minute, you don't even have to talk about it, just think about it. What is your positionality in relation to the engaged work that you do? How do people read and see you? How do you see yourself? And then how do institutions like the US government label you, right? So different layers of positionality, how you see yourself, what you know about yourself, how people see you, and then how you're classified by a specific institution, whether it's the US government, so like citizen, non-citizen status, immigrant status, undocumented status, um, or how you're seen maybe at the university level. Are you an assistant professor, associate professor? Are you a lecturer? What is your positionality? Thinking about all of these things, take maybe just 30 seconds to reflect on that for a, sec for a minute. When I was first taught about positionality, I focused on myself so much that I didn't think about how much my positionality and how I'm viewed by others um, impacts any community project that I do. When I walk into a room, there are certain things that people are gonna notice, like my white skin. Um, they're gonna notice the fact that, although this is me, <laughs> Um, they, might, they might notice that I speak with a pretty traditional American accent. Um, this is actually me um, standing in front of my elementary school. I was about nine years old. This was the semester that my family and I immigrated to the United States from Santa Cruz, Bolivia to Orlando, Florida. So I was standing in front of my school. I remember going through this transition where I learned to speak English as a second language, of course. Um, and I remember sitting in front of the mirror in the bathroom at my grandma's house trying to make my mouth move in ways that resembled what I I heard in school so that I wouldn't have an accent. Um, because even at nine years old, I realized that my white privilege would allow me to quote unquote blend in, but I also realized that there were certain things about me that would never blend in, right? And so, of course, leaning into that privilege, like many of us do, I wanted to mask my accent, I wanted to get rid of who I was, um, and this transition period really shaped who I became as a teacher, who I became as a scholar, who I became as a community engaged practitioner, because I wanted to create spaces where people People didn't feel like they needed to get rid of part of their identities to do the work of learning, to do the work of writing, to do the work of building community with each other. So that's part of my positionality. Um, part of my positionality is also the work that I've done, and I, I want to tell you a little bit about that work today. I'll be sharing some examples of what I've done, some examples from the research that I've done. But what I want to emphasize is that my work continues to change and evolve because my conceptions of language continue to change and evolve. When I was first writing my, uh, my monograph that stems from my dissertation, I, work as pr I focused predominantly on Spanish speakers because that was something that I could relate to. Um, as my work continued, I realized Spanish itself is a, is a colonial language and it's done a lot of violence to people in a lot of different contexts. So I started collaborating with indigenous language speakers in multiple different contexts, which is where the next book projects kind of stem from. And so something that I want us to think about is that our positionality shifts as we evolve, it shifts as we learn new things, as we change, as we realize that some things we had done in the past were not the best and we needed to make improvements. And I think this is a critical time for us to have some grace with ourselves and also with each other, but to also remember that um, we're not always in control of our positionality and what that affords us in community spaces. When we think about positionality, as Jesse also did so brilliantly um, in the introduction, we also have to think about space. We have to think about land. We have to think about the context in which our work is happening. And this is something that I also try to model for my students. So for example, I'm visiting here from Gainesville, Florida, which is unceded land of the Seminole, Timucua, and Potano peoples. I teach at the University of Florida, whose, land, whose law school is built over sto uh, stolen and sacred Timucua burial, burial grounds. Previously, the University of Florida was the Ocala-based East Florida Seminary, which was founded and funded by owners of enslaved people whose families and legacies still fuel the school today. At my university, recent policies preventing academic freedom have led to lawsuits between faculty and upper administration, to the harassment of faculty who were told that they cannot teach courses with the titles that include the words critical and race next to each other, that's real, you can look it up, <laughs> to faculty, and in particular black faculty, resigning consistently over discrimination and health-based oppressions. 
If you look on the university website, you might also see that I work at one of the nation's top five universities. They love to talk about that. The flagship school in the state. If you look more closely, you'll also see that this flagship school is the only one in the state whose res registration of black students has steadily decreased over the last 10 years, despite census numbers that demonstrate the opposite should be happening. So I mentioned this context because I believe that this type of historical grounding and accountability are critical to building community with our students, as well as with our community partners um, outside the university. So in my classes, including the community engagement courses and the writing courses and the professional writing courses that I teach, I ask students to do some of this research. So much like we did research for the land acknowledgements today, to do some of this research to engage with what is happening outside of the university, to recognize how the university or how communities outside of the university are actually sustaining the work that we're doing at the university. I asked them to do some research about the land that we all inhabit and engage with, whether we're sitting in our homes and talking through a screen or walking through campus. I asked students to think about land, space, and place as we build community together. So this is an excerpt, and I'm happy to share any of these materials. I wanted to give you like some examples of how this plays out in practice. So in this assignment, um, it's called the Community Mapping Project. I asked students to actually do some research about the indigenous communities um, around the university, about the history of slavery and its connections to the university, also about current things that are happening, like how the prison industrial system in Florida and Florida state schools are so interconnected. Um, so I asked them things like, who is UF accountable to? Who are we accountable to as members of the UF community? What is the history and the contemporary realities of our university, of our city, the communities around us? And for many of my students, this is the first time they've really thought about what's happening outside of the university, what's happening outside of their classes, because our universities are so insular most of the time. And so students have the opportunity to think about you know, all the important and critical events that have taken place and are continuing to take place at the, the university. And they sometimes, if we're, if we're lucky, start to get involved in these efforts. So I wanted to show you a couple of quick examples. For, um, for, so for this project in particular, this student and all of the students who I'm featuring tonight know that they're being featured and they're very excited and gave me permission to share their work. Um, so this student, Malena de Tomas, she is an education major. And so what she did was she created a map of the zip codes in Gainesville, the income based on zip codes in Gainesville, and then the school rating um, and then the money that goes into the different schools. So as a future educator, she got to see that, of course, the poorest, most diverse zip codes get the least resources and are therefore rated the worst in our local context. And this prepares her as an educa a future educator um, to have some data behind the, the information that she's sharing in her classes, to have some data in preparation for um, for her future program. And so this type of assignment, this type of helping students do their research to get to understand the history and also the contemporary reality outside of the university can be really helpful. Um, and students kind of take it in all different directions. So I wanted to share that application with you. Um, and I'm happy to share the assignment sheet later as well. Just wanted to quickly show you she actually did all the mapping and like found the zip codes and stuff like that. So a long lineage of women of color academics, community activists, and organizers consistently demonstrate that building community requires both reflection on the communities we come from and critical engagement with those around us. In addition to asking students to research our local communities then, I also find it important to ask students to share and reflect on the communities that shape them. So we're doing research about where we are, what communities are around us, but then also share and do research about themselves so that we can see the relationality between those two things. So in, in the, her discussion of the role that community engagement plays in the educational experiences of Chicana and Latina students, for example, Estrella Torres explains that while, quote, oftentimes university ethos encourages the bifurcation of life into neat categories, scholar, Chicana, mother, or activist, in the lived experiences of Chicana scholars, these aspects commonly overlap, inform, and guide one another. Part of building community in our courses then requires us as instructors to recognize that communities, the communities and knowledges that shape our students and to implement this knowledge as central rather than tangential to the work that we do in our classes. 
So in many classes, as many of you probably do, um, it's common practice to in introduce brief introductory activities at the beginning of the semester or discussion boards where students introduce themselves, their major, and perhaps their interests as a way to build community in the, cl in the classroom. In my own adaptation of this assignment, and I'll share that with you here, I found it helpful to have students introduce not only themselves, but also the communities they come from and the languages they speak, completing short video essays that demonstrate their community journey box. So this, again, is just an excerpt. I'm happy to share the full assignment with people. Um, and I adapted this from uh, my colleague, Dr. Tracy Flores, who's at UT Austin. Um, but the community journey box assignment doesn't just ask students to tell me, tell me a little bit about yourself and who you're, or where you're from and, and what your major is, but it asks them to think about what communities do you come from? Who are the communities that shape you, right? Asking students to think about, we all have community with someone. We're all building community with someone. Sometimes that's your family. Sometimes that's your chosen family. Sometimes that's an organization that you work with. Sometimes it's your classmates. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you felt excluded from a, from a community for a specific reason. And I asked students to create these short video essays where they discuss this. And so this is a way that I found can help us genuinely bring in students' backgrounds and communities into um, our engaged learning classroom. So I'll share with you a brief clip um, of, of one of these students' assignments. My name is Elizabeth Rivas, and this is my community journey box. My family is the first community I belong to. They were very vital in my development of character and principles. I love my family very much. We aren't perfect, and we butt heads 99% of the time. Nonetheless, we form a vital role in each other's lives, because aside from all the stress and problems that arise, we serve as a great support system to each other. This is a picture of my parents and four siblings in my niece's baby shower. And these are pictures of me with my niece and nephew, the cutest babies in the world. When I think of community, I think of the countries I am part of, Cuba and the U.S., I've always had an existential crisis because I've never been Cuban enough or American enough, but truly, these two countries make up who I am. For those in Cuba, I'm Americanized, and for those here, I'm an immigrant. And the thing is, they are both right. I am both of those things, which is why a community I strongly believe I belong to is Hispanics in the US, as weird as that sounds. Because it is true, we're not like those back home or those here, but we are them. So it might sound strange or contradicting even, but in a way we have created our own identity as house. This is a picture of me and my Colombian American friend, Isabella, a person who helped me accept that I belong to both countries. So Elizabeth goes on to talk about marching band and all the other communities that she's a part of. Um, as, as evidence in Elizabeth's video, creating a community journey box project allows students to reflect on their identities, and to centralize the role that community plays in their education. Furthermore, in the assignment for this project, students are asked to consider their own creation of digital media in relation to accessibility, finding ways to increase access by including captions, image descriptions, and other elements that can help them reach wider audiences in their discussion of community and its role in education. Throughout this process, our class opens up space to centralize identity and language in our work as things that happen together, not things that are separate rather than pretending or extending, like Tora said, the bifurcation of our various identities are separate from our work in the classroom. So you might have noticed Elizabeth um, did have image descriptions and captions in her video, because as we think about positionality, right, we talk about, okay, what communities do you come from? What, what do you want to share about your communities? But also, who are you sharing this with? It's not always going to be people from the same background as you, people who have different abilities than you do, people who orient to this work or engage with this work differently. So when we think about positionality again, right, especially as we're thinking about community and preparing perhaps to do a community engaged project, we have to think about what we're sharing, how we're sharing it, and who we're providing access for in those interactions. In her article, Wanted, some, long, some black long distance writers, blackboard flavor flaving and other Afro digital experiences in the classroom, Dr. Carmen Kennard analyzes black students' online discourse on blackboard discussion posts to illustrate how students experience rhetoric and writing as a way to alter the ways knowledge is constructed for them and about them, revocabulary, re -vocabulary, re -vocabulary, I can't say that word, creating new vocabularies, <laughs> the academy and its technologies. 
In this discussion, Kennard emphasizes that her students' communicative practices online, centralizing African American languages, knowledges, and discourses, was not some performative action in response to a prompt. And I want to emphasize that because oftentimes when we think about multilingual students in our classrooms, we think, talk about our diverse students in the classrooms, making up space for them, welcoming them, it's not necessarily in genuine ways, right? Not a performative action in response to a prompt. Instead, Kennard explains, writing sites are not passive places to provide some sort of psychological buffer to my students or to showcase the separate spaces where I allow the mother tongue for writing. The purpose is to create a space for the empowerment of minority students and the pluralization of dominant discourses. The same is true whether we're working with students in online or in physical spaces or in community spaces, right? We're not creating these spaces where we're giving students a voice. Our students have a voice, but we're building spaces to incorporate these voices into our classroom in the most powerful ways possible. So in writing studies, education, and other fields, ongoing conversations and policies encourage writing teachers to welcome, to invite students' languages into the classroom. As many scholars point out, linguistic diversity is a presence in our reality in our classrooms. We can't deny it. The numbers are there, right? Our students are multilingual. Whether we want to acknowledge this or not, it's true. And adjusting our assignments and practices to respect and recognize linguistic diversity is our responsibility as educators. But again, we need to do this in a way that's authentic. We need to create the rhetorical situation where language diversity is actually going to be seen as an asset or something safe to do in our classrooms. So I want to show you some examples or share with you some examples of, um, from my research about how we might do this, especially as we think about building community with our students. So in 2013, um, I did some focus groups with multilingual students from multiple different countries. And I decided to do these focus groups because I noticed that my students were incredibly creative when it came to multimodal projects. Um, sometimes when I asked them to write an alphabetic text, they would freak out. <laughs> they would, you know, they would get so stressed out and not turn something in or turn something that they weren't, um, turn something that they weren't so proud of. But when I said, you can create a video, you can create a podcast, you can create, there weren't podcasts in 2013. Um, you can create, you know, an infographic. They really excelled. And I wanted to know why, because I wanted to incorporate genuine ways to build community with my students and incorporate their languages into my classroom. So I asked students, I brought them together in a focus group. These are screenshots from very bad 2013 uh, photography um, of these focus groups. And I asked students, can you tell me a little bit about your process writing alphabetic text in the classroom? What does that process look like for you? Do you have, what challenges do you experience or what things do you enjoy? And they said things like, um, I like writing, but what I really struggle with is getting my ideas from my head to the paper. And I noticed that across the different focus groups that I did, across the languages, the body language that students were using to describe alphabetic text remained pretty similar. Get things from the head to the paper. And they made these very linear gestures from the head to the paper, from the head to the paper. And that was a struggle, this direct you know, transposition from the head to the paper. And I said, OK, so what about multimodal projects? I noticed you did a great video. You know, I noticed you did. Um, you created an awesome infographic. What, 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 what about that process? And they said, you know, well, you know, a video is just more flexible. And they started making gestures like this, where they could pull something from here and something from here and something from here. And they said things like, you know, sometimes because English is not my first language, I can't think of the word I want to use right away to write it down on my paper, but I can think about a beat of a song. And I was like, wow, that's so brilliant, right? So why am I not incorporating um, opportunities for students to start with a beat of a song instead of starting with the writing from here to here? Can we build up to that? Can we engage in conversation to lead us to that? Why do we have to start with the thing that makes the most sense to me as the instructor? So building community with multilingual students is thinking about what assets they're bringing to the table and how we can incorporate those opportunities genuinely into our classroom space. It's not saying you can write in any language you want. It's saying you can communicate to me what you're thinking in the way that makes the most sense, here are some examples, and I'm not going to punish you for quote unquote not getting it right or not doing it the way that I want. This is a screenshot from an interview that I did with one of my participants for my book, Sites of Translation, that really helped me think about participation with multilingual students and community building. Um, the woman pictured here 
Um, her name is Katie Coronado. She hates the screenshot, but she said I could share it with you. <laughs> and so in this uh, interview, I was, um, I was having a conversation with Katie. She runs a news broadcasting organization for Latinx students at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Um, the students here focus on translating news stories from English to Spanish for their community. And she says that translation, that act of translating things into Spanish for their community is what allows these students to stay motivated and stay in school. So she's very passionate. I was asking her you know, what I thought was a very simple question. And I said, you started Nightly Latino. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Can you tell me about you know, like your passion for it, why you decided to do it? I thought that was a simple question, right? So over here on the left-hand side, you see 00 00.52. So this is a time, like a time map. And it goes from 52 to 155. So this is a span of about a minute, a minute and three seconds or so. And so I, wait, I had asked the question, I waited 52 seconds and Katie wasn't saying anything. And I was like, this is so strange. You know, like, why are you not answering this question? This seems like such an easy question. And she said, she just like waited for a while and she was looking very uncomfortable. And after a while she said, hmm, I think, I think what's happening is I'm thinking in Spanish and I can't really think of an answer right now. And I said, okay, no problem. Tell me in Spanish, you know, why, why you created this group. And you see in the second slide, or the second uh, row here, her eyebrows just arch up. And she said, I can talk in Spanish. And as soon as I said, yes, you can talk in Spanish, and it made sense in that situation, you can see Katie got super confident, her shoulders kind of stood up, and she went in and told me exactly what, you know, this group meant for her, why it was important, and why it was so powerful. I think about this as I think about my multilingual students. I also think about this as I think about multilingual community members and the work that we do in community context when we ask a question and expect a response in a specific language or in a specific way. I could have very easily, and I may have, Katie was not my student, right? She was a professor. Um, I could have easily thought, wow, Katie doesn't know the answer to this. That's strange. Or Katie doesn't have much to say about this. Or Katie is not participating. She's not engaged in my classroom or she's not engaged in this project. But it was the creation of a space where she felt comfortable enough with me to say, I think I'm thinking in Spanish. And then my reaction to say, okay, that's fine. That led to her actually articulating an amazing answer that was very useful for the book and also um, very reflective of what her values are in this organization. So it makes me think about when we're doing research in community context or when we're trying to build community with our multilingual students, how can we open up these spaces where we're not expecting an answer to come in the form that we would like the answer to come in, but when we're expecting a genuine answer based on the rhetorical context that we're working within. To me, that's thinking about community building through a multilingual orientation. Um, so I wanna show you just one more quick clip, uh, quick video from a research project um, to emphasize the fact that multilingual communicators, whether we're thinking in community context or in our classroom context, say a lot without saying anything at all. And so a lot of times when we're asked a question or when we're asked you know, in dialogue, the word, like my student said, might not come right away, but there's other ways that we communicate our ideas. So I'm gonna show you this quick clip. For this project, we had asked, um, th these were students at Michigan State University at the time. We asked them, they were all multilingual students, and we asked them, can you tell us about a word in your home language that's untranslatable into English? What I want you to pay attention to in just this really quick clip is not just what the students are saying, but how they're moving their bodies, what different examples they're giving, maybe they tell different stories, what different resources they're using to communicate. So if you would pay attention to that as these students discuss their untranslatable words. So we were just giggle, and um, you use it to describe your emotion whenever you see something that's super cute. It's so cute, it's that emotion that you get when you just wanna carry it and squeeze it and shake it. This one is uh, camote. It means uh, sweet potato in English. Uh, for us, it means a person that gets angry pretty easy. For example, this one, afriolon. This is an adjective that is, uh, it's sexy, but it's classy sexy. I like the word sobremesa. It's the word we use to define the the time that we spend after uh, uh, lunch or dinner, we just talk, we have the, the coffee, the cigarette. This says toboni. 
and it literally means like you bury me it's like a twisted kind of like romantic like feeling where it's just like I'd basically rather just like be buried than like not be like without you we have a word that to describe uh, a, the adjective of a person that is always cold and we would say it's friolenta okay enhache is um, a way that you look someone when you had kind of maybe like a problem with this person so you roll your eyes like back with like oof no that's an hatch komelemi means like uh, sunbeams uh, swimming through uh, through trees so this this sunbeam called komelemi if you're if you're playing around with somebody and they and they piss you off you say oh te voy a dar un cocotazo which means i'm gonna hit you with a coconut you were just so dumb like nobody would ever do that uh kafune is uh, a noun uh, is an act you put your hand and put your hand uh, above uh, a hair and you pass your hand softly this one is my favorite one it's called gursha gursha is when you feed someone like directly it kind of expresses like our cultures like how hospitable we are and how like food is a big important thing for us this is in syrian we say mafi domari if I say it anywhere other than Syria, no one will understand. Mafi domari means it's it's empty. No one is there. The domari is a guy in a in a city called Duma who used to put the lights that when you there used to be candles at the night. So when you go out and you say Mafi domari, it means this guy is not even there. So it's it's empty. There's nobody. No, there's no even lights. So it's very specific, very historical. You know, has something that is meaningful to us. And no one will understand it but us. When you're when you're in a in a language, uh, you, that becomes your worldview. It's almost like like when the the ant that's like lives on an elephant just sees the skin of the elephant and they think oh that's how there is and then they get on a helicopter. I know this is a crazy story. So and then they start to see the whole thing. It's almost like like every, all of us are just kind of in our own little world. And when you get out of that, you kind of know you kind of realize how the mind can really work. Okay, so you saw some examples. Um, my collaborators and I, what we did was we actually coded the different strategies that these multilingual communicators did to communicate when a word was not available right away. And you may have noticed some of these. People told stories, right? To communicate a single concept, they told a whole story. People used body language. Somebody pulled up a picture, right? All of these rhetorical strategies that students use when they wanted to communicate an idea and they couldn't necessarily rely on words right away. This is being a skilled rhetorician, right? So what if we reposition language diversity as being a skilled rhetorician who can draw from all of these different resources to communicate an idea. You might have also noticed some hedging that happened specifically by the women, right? You may have noticed that they said, oh, this is just so silly, but you know, and then they would say something super brilliant, right? Because language is an embodied practice. Some people, when they walk into a room before they say anything, are assumed to be illiterate, to not be articulate, to not be confident, to not be skilled. And those things over time get conditioned into how we deal with and how we engage with language. So paying attention to these translation strategies, what exactly our multilingual students are doing in our classroom to communicate when they may not necessarily be able to or want to rely just on words can be a really helpful strategy for building community with students, with community partners in multilingual contexts. Um, and, and that's just the case in our contemporary world. Th those are the people that we are working with more and more. So it's important to pay attention to not just what's said, but also what isn't said and how different things are communicated. I know this is difficult to see, I'll, I'll share the link with you all, but I wanna emphasize when I position this idea of incorporating translation into all of our classrooms, I always get the question, but what about, um, what about our multi, um, monolingual students, the students who only speak English? I always get asked that question, so I wanna answer it before the, the Q&A. Um, just like any form of accessibility, when we focus on those who are most marginalized, we make a space more accessible for everybody. 
when we create a multilingual space in our classrooms, when we create a multilingual space in our community projects, we make it more engaging for everyone. So in my classes, this is an excerpt from a, an assignment called a notebook of relations. So instead of doing individual reading responses, these are graduate students now, I ask my graduate students to keep a notebook of relations where they take notes on the reading together. Each one of them picks a color, so you see like Alexander is blue, Alan is purple, Nicole is green, and throughout the semester, they take notes um, on their readings together. And because we center a translation framework as a community building approach in the classroom, students start to say when they're vulnerable and they don't know the meaning of a word. And so one student will say, you know, something, something about ambivalence. And another student said, what do you mean by ambivalence? Because now we can zoom in and we can say we don't have a shared meaning for all of these words. We have to negotiate that meaning and understand how we're using it in a specific context. So when you open up and you centralize multilingualism as part of your community building strategies in your classroom and your community projects, people are going to feel more comfortable, right? And this holds for first generation students, for students who are new to college, it holds for them because now they can say, hey, I don't define that the same way that you do. And now we can have a conversation about that all by centralizing the expertise um, and the strategies that have been developed by the multilingual community members and the multilingual students. Finally, and I'm closing out here. I know we want to eat. Um, we also engage in multilingual community building with community partnerships. And so these are three different screenshots, one of my professional writing courses, where I again incorporate these ideas of setting an intention, talking about language, talking about positionality. We work with a community partner to create fotonovelas, so like these short stories or comics for the community um, uh, in, different, in different languages. At first, I did not ask my students to translate these community projects. The community partner did not ask my students to translate these community projects. But we talked about accessibility. We talked about positionality. We talked about language as an asset. And my students said, hey, in our community mapping project, I saw that a lot of people here speak Spanish and a lot of people speak Haitian Creole. A couple of people in our class speak Spanish and Haitian Creole. Should we translate these materials for these community partners? And I said, oh, I think, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> and the community partner said, yes, that sounds awesome. And they ha this is something the community partner hadn't done before. And they said that this made such a huge difference because now the community partner could reach a new community based on the fact that students saw their language diversity not as something they had to hide, not as something they had to keep under wraps and hide their accent or whatever, but as something that they were contributing and could contribute to the classroom. So in her article, Responsibility, Reciprocity, and Respect, Storytelling as a Means of University Community Engagement, Dr. Torres so clearly explains, quote, it has always fascinated me that, as sites of knowledge production, universities have historically failed to recognize the immense knowledge base produced by those within a few short miles of its university campus. University infrastructures often ignore and discredit community knowledges surrounding our universities, as well as the knowledge sitting in our in-person classes and in our online classes. While universities are sites of knowledge production, only certain kinds of knowledges get valued. Only certain stories get shared. Only certain stories get heard. And only certain types of discourses are welcomed. Yet, going back to Adrian Marie Brown's point, we can and we do make changes in these systems through small but powerful interactions. Thank you all so much. <laughs>